Hi, I'm Ross O'Hennessy, and you're listening to Hellblazer Biz with Chris Gordon. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, listeners, wherever you are in the world right now. This is Hellblazer Biz with your host, as always, me, Chris Gordon. Today, I bring to you an excellent guest with a great career so far. He also starts my Knights of the Damned Week. Known for his roles in The Bastard Executioner, Da Vinci's Demons, and as Lord of Bones in The Game of Thrones, I proudly introduce to you Ross O'Hennessy. Good evening, Ross. Thank you. It's my pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> Excellent. So, as you know, I've got questions for you. It's been uh, great to finally t- uh, sort of meet you after being on Twitter and and Facebook trying to arrange this for so long around your busy schedule, which is great to yeah, obviously yeah. the fact that you are so busy. <laughs> Yeah, I must apologise for that. It's very difficult for actors because when we get involved in a project, um, our lives generally go on hold, you know, until we finish that project and then we try to pick everything up afterwards. Exactly. I mean, you know, your filming schedules in the middle of the night lasting 12, 15 hour days. It's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah very much. It's impossible. I actually did some filming. I started my first film. It must have been September now. Okay. Um, I was, I was trying to get back into it myself. So it's one thing I've, I've been trying to, you know, I've started up again but i was lucky enough yeah. lo- a local film was doing um, some work and it was it was a featured extra in my first ever role and i ended up with 15 lines and a t- scene at the end which is i can't go into it because it will spoil the end but it was a it was a it was a key scene um so i'm really quite 15, 15 lines can be a, a scene stealer if you do it right I, i'm hoping i did i looked back at some of the photos and thought oh good god you look awful <laughs> <laughs> But then again, it might yeah, it might turn out all right. But yeah, no, it's a nice little independent film, so I'm quite happy at that. My my first outing on film, yeah, done theatre work excellent. in the past, but yeah, that was my first film. So yeah, I I sat around for hours on end, so I can completely sympathise when you, in the roles that you get after you know, <laughs> endless days and. <laughs> There's a famous story from when Judy Dench was uh, shooting one of the uh, James Bond movies, mm. and one of the uh, ex um, one of the runners went up to her and said. You know, uh, the director wants me to apologize for you waiting in your trailer while we're trying to set up the scene. Mm-hmm. And Judy Dench's reply was, uh, darling, you pay me for the waiting, the acting I do for free. <laughs> That's a fantastic answer. <laughs> <laughs> and again, it's I mean, that kind of, yeah, it's, it's something we'll, we'll probably bump into with the question as well. It's uh, it's it's the passion. And I think that's when I talk to guys like yourself. You, it's it's a renowned, it's an overall feeling that the acting isn't actually a work for you at all. It's it's a passion. It's what you know. You're living, what you your dreams, and it's you know <laughs> hard to try and put into words myself now. But you know, it's yeah, yeah, it's it's not a job. It's 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 it is you. It's alive. <laughs> I think that's true because um, all actors have to deal with an awful lot of negativity in their career. There's an awful lot of no, you're not right for this role, or no, we can't hire you for that role. And I think as an actor, if you don't have the passion to get past the no's, uh, you'll never make it to the yeses. So uh, I think anybody that's um, you know, moderately successful in the business has gone through an awful lot of no's in their time. Yeah, yeah, I can totally uh, relate to that. I think uh, in, in a similar relation to my podcast, for example, um, I'm learning... <laughs> <laughs> that the passion, the passion. I actually had an interview. Uh, I'm not going to say who it was with, but on Friday it was a, a job interview, and I fi- I've actually right. made it to the final. But one thing I put across there was passion, because exactly what you've just said. I said, you know, for every for every guest that I get, for example, on my podcast, there's at least a hundred no's behind it, or a hundred people who've just not publicists who've just never responded to you, and. So when it when I do get a guest, it, you know, it, it really it, it's a, it, if you don't have that passion, you can't continue. Because if I didn't have the passion, like you guys, if you didn't have that passion, you just get knocked back with all the you know with the amount of negativity that there is out there. Very true. I I don't think that like actors actors are almost um, the eternal optimist because <laughs> every time they receive a no, they still believe in their head something better will happen tomorrow. Yeah. And that's kind of like the perfect, the perfect scenario for an actress to always believe that tomorrow is better than today. And that within, no matter how many no's you get, you'll always want to do your, your business and your craft. Exactly, exactly. Things happen for a reason. That's the other way. It's exactly the other way. So yeah, yeah. You, you get a no then, exactly, you, you fall down and get something better the next day. Really? Exactly. So that's fantastic. I mean, I got told today I can work from home tomorrow. And then I got told half an hour after that, I got phoned that I've got to have a Skype interview with California 
as a final interview for this role. So I was like, well, that's obviously happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> I fell straight into the lap. So, you know, yeah, things do happen for a reason. So that optimism is always a good thing to have. Right. Now get on to acting and get on to yourself. <laughs> okay. First question is, what, what made you decide to get into acting in the first place? Um, I was part of the air training corps when I was um, like 12 and 13. Mm-hmm. My brother was. Mm-hmm. And um, we did a gang show every single year. And the gang show was just the cadets messing around doing different Monty Python sketches and stuff yeah, like oh that. And we did it. And I remember just thinking that I liked it, that it was different to be on the stage and to be doing something slightly different. So, mm-hmm. so I, kind of, I kept it quiet to myself that I wanted to be an actor. Um, and then when I was about 15, I kind of mentioned it to my mum that I wanted to be an actor. And she went and set up an audition for me to join the National Youth Theatre of London. Okay. And went to an audition for them, and I was successful. Uh, and then I went to London and spent six weeks with the National Youth Theatre um, doing a training course. And that six weeks kind of changed me as a person. Mm-hmm. You know, I was um, a small uh, son of a working class Welsh family. And then I was thrown into the heart of London to do acting with some big names. And, and, and I just realized that was what I wanted to do. Yeah. And um, when I returned home, I finished up in school, auditioned for drama school. And next thing you know, I'm living in London from 17 onwards. Fantastic. That's, that's a nice, uh, nice story to be living your dream. We've actually got something very in common because that's why I started smirking and laughing when you mentioned about the uh, yeah, training corps. Uh, right. I think we're probably about the similar age because I was in the Sea Cadet Corps. And we did, we we called them sods operas. So (laughs) so it's the same sort of thing. And Monty, yeah, Monty Python sketches. And I I was in the Navy reserves for two years. And one of the Monty Python sketches we did was the barbershop. Yeah. We just sidled on, but we didn't have the barbershop clothes. So we had ponchos down the front, obviously nothing underneath. And the ponchos tucked in at the back. So obviously there was complete bare. So we all sidled on. And it was yeah, like yeah. saying, sit on my face. And then we just turned off and sidled off sideways. <laughs> so obviously everyone just got a picture of four <laughs> bare asses behind us. It, was... <laughs> it, it was, just reminded it, it, me straight of that one. It was such a different world. Like I think of like when I did things with the air training corps and we did um, the uh, wakey, wakey, Polly parrot. This is a dead <laughs> parrot sketch and things like that. Yeah. And I just think, you know, that it was it was all great fun when I was young. But now... Because we live in such a careful PC world, oh, yes. you could never allow 14 and 15 year old kids to be doing Monty Python humour. Not at all, not at all. It's, uh, <laughs> and I think that I think that's sadly something that's lost. To be honest, it's you know, it's not harmful. The, you know, Monty Python humour is not harmful whatsoever. It's not politically correct a lot of the time, but it's yeah. it's just not harmful. And yeah, I think you know, I, you do find a lot of kids nowadays. I think when they find stuff like Python and Blackadder as well. Yeah. You, you know, they're just so blown away by it because there's nothing like it anymore. It's just, It was a pure... I mean, they found it the way for modern comedy. And, uh, yeah, I'll, I can talk all night about them. <laughs> if we need to... <laughs> singing tops of my voices over the moors, you know, singing uh, all the different Python songs and... Yeah, yeah. Reciting Blackadder at three in the morning on Stag. <laughs> and and, uh, and when you did your Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme... That was yeah. all you kept reciting different uh, Monty Python numbers as you're walking across the mountains. Yeah, I did all that the same, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah, we did all those Brecon Beacons as well, probably similar to where you did, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a, f- a fantastic time to be growing up, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Through all the Monty Pythons. Cool. Excellent. So did you and do you have any role models who inspired you or inspire you now? Um, yes, I most certainly did. Um, when I went to drama school, um, I auditioned because my, my parents struggled to find the full finance for me to go to drama school. Mm-hmm. So I auditioned for Sir John Mills and Sir John Mills agreed to pay for my education at drama school in London. Wow. So I won the Sir John Mills scholarship. And uh, up until that point, I wasn't really quite clued up to who Sir John Mills was because he was kind of a, you know, an actor from a period before me. Yeah, so I classical. started studying. I started studying all of the old um, films mm-hmm. and, uh, and and John Mills became at that time, not only because he was paying for me to be at drama school uh, until he passed away, bless him. Uh, but I but also became quite um, idolized yeah. by him because because um, oh, I found him an idol. Sorry, because he was paying my way and he'd been such a fantastic and prolific actor in his time. 
So, uh, so my early years were kind of um, almost um, trying to replicate the actors of the 60s and the 70s, mm-hmm. um, which obviously didn't go down well at drama school because they wanted us to be actors now <laughs> of the 80s. Yeah, yeah. No, that's cool. I mean, yeah, I mean, Sir John Mills, um, bless him, he was one of the finest, you know, alongside Alec Guinness and, you know, you've uh, got David Niven, Olivier, they were, they were just a whole generation of, of just remember outstanding quality. One of my first jobs after I left drama school was I did a play with Lauren Bacall um, okay. at Chichester and um, Alec Guinness came to visit her uh, and as soon as he was in the building, like, like the rumours went round, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi building, <laughs> Obi-Wan Kenobi building. And I remember just as a young 21-year-old actor racing, racing out just yeah. because I wanted to casually walk past Lauren Bacall's dressing room just so I could walk <laughs> past Alec Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> and why not? <laughs> it's like, you know, that's an opportunity not many people would ever have. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you see him? <laughs> I did. I did. I did. Uh, and, and he just nodded a, a polite hello because he'd just seen me on stage and, and then he went into Miss McCall's dressing room and I remember just, uh, I ran home and phoned my mum and I said, I've just seen Obi-Wan Kenobi live in flesh. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty, that's a pretty cool story to be fair. <laughs> Excellent. And obviously now um, the question here is, have you done theatre, which you obviously have, you've started out in theatre as well. Um, what's your preferred media, theatre or film? Or is it a mix of both? It seems to be very similar answer here. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Um, I, I left drama school and I, I had a, a lucky break doing this uh, play with Lauren Bacall, and then that took me into the Royal Shakespeare Company. So I did a couple of plays with the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, and to to be honest with you, I, I like stage, but I find the repetition of the same work mm-hmm. over the space of the year. So when I was at the Royal Shakespeare Company, we were doing the same plays for eighteen months. Um, and I, I found, for me as an actor, reproducing the acting on a on an eight times a week show basis for a year to two years, um, I found that very difficult. Yeah. I, I I become slowly bored with myself and my performance, and, and that's the struggle for me. So, um, so I left doing theatre quite a while ago, and now I mainly only do television because I I I I, I get a thrill out of the fast pace mm-hmm. of television. So I was um I was quite. Uh, I would I would say I'm I'm more happier doing film and TV work. All right, excellent. That's a great answer. Uh, so uh, the varied people I speak to, there's all varied answers every single time <laughs> about how you find it. But um, you're right. I think if you do long running shows with the theatre, I guess it could come as a you know it becomes monotonous, especially with it, you know with it, you know I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying maybe if you, if like you say for two years because I love the theatre and one thing that's you know I absolutely adore is going to the theatre. But I can see where for an actor it could. Yeah, it, it wasn't that I found the work monotonous. It's that I found monotony in me. Yeah. Um, maybe I, my attention span is too short. Um, <laughs> Maybe I struggle on keeping my mind on things. You know, the work itself is fantastic. Shakespeare's work is brilliant. And, oh, gotcha. you know, I, I can't knock that. But it was just in me. After a while, I start to um, lose myself instead yeah. of being committed to the project. Yeah. You started getting a bit itchy feet and you wanted to do something new and move on to Very much. change it. No, that's, that's a great answer. That's a nice. It is actually a different opinion as well than a lot of people because a lot of people do, you know, they balance them both out and this, yeah. that, and the other. Because obviously, theatre, you've got the intimacy and if you get it wrong you've really got it wrong <laughs> whereas tv you can do several takes before you if you make it up excellent so is there an actor who'd love to work with either maybe a dis- a sort of a past actor or a current actor your dream um, person you'd like to work with i this is going to sound really cheesy um but i would actually really be thrilled uh, to work with Sylvester Sloan all right cool Simply because I think that we don't have many actors these days who are so iconic. Mm-hmm. Whether you think he's a good actor or a bad actor, it, it, that's, that's all irrelevant. We, we've got many Hollywood celebrities now who are quite plain. Yes. Where Sylvester mm-hmm. Sloan is of a period when actors were iconic. And mm-hmm. he is an iconic character. And still now he's 67. Uh, yeah. And I saw... I watched Creed the other day, and he's still producing iconic work in, in even in his in his sixties. Um, and I know loads of actors 
would say to me, "Oh, you know, it's 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 not true work. He's a you know he's a parody of himself." But you know, you got to 